Hi, Andrew Armstrong, and welcome to the back office Teardown Lab. Today, we're going to be talking about this guy, the Inspiration Engine. Uh, and that's because several of you have been asking questions about this since my little mini reveal review uh, in a previous video. So I thought I'd just show you the progress a little bit. Um, I've got um, five units basically built and uh, three of them with me. And uh, I've broken the keyboards on these because I've... Uh, through a little bit of bad programming, right. so just as I was getting to grips with the framework, um, I may have destroyed the port expanders on these. So kindly, uh, Asnavor, Matt has sent me uh, two chips. He ordered, made an order with Mouser or something, DigiKey, and they're gone their way. Now, this unit though, I've not broken because this unit contains the most recent version of the software and the various uh, upgrades and drivers and things like that I've been doing to it and also you can see I took the liberty when the camera focuses to show you that the screen protector has been removed from this one and the header so this is actually soldered straight onto the board so you can see it's nice and thin and look, there's those little cheeky cheeky little pull-up resistors I forgot to put in the design so what we have here is a micro USB port and an SD card because some people said they weren't so clear in the previous video and on this side of course you have the 32-bit audio DAC and the headphone socket and another little tiny bodge wire because somebody made a little mistake in the circuit but forget about that that's fine that's not gonna be there when we get going with this um, there have been further improvements to, of course, in the software. So they've been, uh, it has now a, uh, some sort of an operating system, although that's a bit grandiose, but it definitely has something on there now. So I can power it up. You wanna see it, don't you, when we power it up? Let me uncoil my USB wire though, so we're not all stepping on each other's feet. Gonna get that in there and booyah. Right, of course, we could be running this off battery too. That works uh, as well. As you can see here, that this is a uh, boot up screen. Now there is sound. Pot noodle speaker turned on, volume up, back again. Right, so I'm gonna hit the restart button and what it will do is that will just restart the system. It does take a moment because I do have and you hear the BBC Micro. Now, Andrew Beer, uh, Sad Ken, says that is sampled from a BBC microcomputer, so that's pretty cool. Um, and it does uh, say a slight delay when it boots because it's loading up some test scripts for the SD card and things like that. So um, we do have Lua running on this now. So this has got a Lua, full Lua 5.3 actually uh, interpreter on here. So if I just uh, enter a typical command like print, print and I'm looking at the keyboard at an angle so bear with me if I do some mistakes so shift I have latching so you can see it tells, shows you on the screen and if you wait a moment the, the screen goes back to the standard mode so it's got a command editor and then it will go back to standard mode but you can always hit like shift or something to get bring it back and then I'm going to say print hello world and then we're gonna close the braces and then when I hit return, so I'll just leave it so it goes back to the regular screen. So you can see that's what's on the regular screen. And then when I hit return, boom, you see Hello World is added. So it's got a very simple three line buffer. I've written a very gentle video buffer for now, guys. I can't, um, I can't sort of race ahead too much of all the drivers. We have to bring them up incrementally. So we've got a video driver there. Uh, it's supposed to do uh, graphics routines, pixels um, and text. You can put text anywhere, but something's not quite right with that. And you can see I'm not using a proportional font, which isn't necessarily ideal because you can't always tell where the edges are. If you hit the go button, of course, that turns the screen on and off so you can pop it into your pocket as a low power mode. And it is very pocketable with the battery, so we will need to design a case first. Now, another thing I want to show you is that was a Lua print command. Now, if you hold down Alt, or just push Alt because it's latching again, and then just push P, bang, I've got an autocomplete on there, which is very much like the Sinclair. If you ever used a Sinclair ZX Spectrum or ZX81, you have that autocomplete. So I have that uh, out on there. And then there's a bunch of um, additional symbols because of course you might want, you've got a comma here, but there's no semicolon on this keyboard if you look at the nomenclature on there. However, you just push symbol and then you just push the 
appropriate symbol key and it will give you all those extended uh, symbol modes. And that's really cool. So we've got loads of opportunity for adding more of those. So we don't have all of the mnemonics for the autocomplete here too as well, but I do have a couple to show you. So if I push the Alt and then push B, you get the beep command. And that's just a simple beep. So uh, you can actually uh, alter that too. So I'm going to push Alt beep and instead of hitting return, I'm going to hit delete because I want to put in some parameters. So I'm going to put in the volume, which is 255, which is the maximum. The frequency, let's do a 1400 hertz and we want it for 200 milliseconds. And then we'll close the braces, hit return. There you go. You can't get better than that. Now, interestingly enough, when this boots up and you hear that beep, there's a script in here called startup.lua, and that's what this runs, because it can run a full script, and your scripts can be very complicated. Even now, you could have a script running on this will be trying to calculate pi to the millionth degree and then give the answer on the screen. It's just, at the moment, a little bit tricky entering it on the screen, because we don't have an editor. But we do have, fortunately, another command, which is more of a system command, so it's not built into Lua right now. It's actually a system interpreted command called Called exec. So if we push uh, Alt E or type write in capital exec and then a file name, and we don't need quotes or anything because it's not actually in the Lua, this is actually in our OS, you know, inspiration, we could call it inspiration OS. Um, so you can see we have the exec command there. And if I type in startup, and I don't need to put the extension dot Lua, I just type exec startup, hit enter, you'll hear. It's loaded up that program, and all that program does is say beep right now. That's all it has in there. But it doesn't just have to do that. You could have, as I say, anything. Um, so if I push Alt E and then push 1, for example, I've see test application 1 comes out. I've actually named uh, a number of files for 1.lua, 2.lua, 3.lua, and uh, just have them saying print application 1. And that just shows you what it does there. And I'll probably try to keep all of the. Um, uh, the number row kind of for that purpose it's quite cute isn't it to keep have the number file but of course you say you can just run uh, anything so exec is still in the buffer you know um, I can show you there exits there I'm going to write test t-e-s-t because -E I do have a test.lua and if we run test.lua see it beeps and says hi this is a test and of course any Star uh, Wars fan will like this one because we can run order 66 and then if you watch this it'll actually play a tune and update the screen so have a little look at this So you could hear um, that was actual Andrew Beer's uh, audio routine, his new beep function. It's got a little issue and he could tell you all about why it's got that and he's getting rid of it. But of course, you heard from the previous video, this can do proper sampled sounds, MP3s and things like that. But as ever with all these things, we want to start at the basics. It's a bit like a bit like BBC basic in terms of you want it to beep, you want it to do file IO. You want it to do keyboard I.O., we want it to do joystick I.O., we want it to then interface to the Wi-Fi, because you want to be able to use that Wi-Fi from within your own programs. And that will then sort of give you, uh, in turns into the accompanying Lua scripting language, the power to pretty much write so many things from the get-go. Um, and we also need an, a text editor, but we might write the text editor in Lua. So, uh, example, we might call it E. For example, we do Alt E, Exit E. <laughs> we might do an E dot Lua, which is the text editor. Or we might just have a graphical screen on here, and you just do you know left, right, scroll your icons and choose. Um, my uh, efforts so far in this last week, though, really belie the power of this this um, hardware. And I want to show you, to show you it can do a lot of amazing things. Um, also, I'd like to show you something else I've been tinkering with, just to show you the flexibility here. So I'm going to power on this other unit. And uh, this other unit um, has the screen on the uh, header still. I've got a few like that because I, I kind of need to sometimes get in there to mess with the wiring. And I can show you why. So I'm going to just zoom in on this one. So you can see this is a slightly uh, different uh, program that's running on here. I've actually attached one of these that you saw in a previous episode, which is the uh, Max 31 uh, 30102 um, 
particle sensor. So that's the particle sensor there. You can see it's shining an LED up. And these are often used, as you can see, for um, on the back of your smartwatch for trying to detect blood flow. Uh, and through various calculations, you can detect pulse and you can also detect the uh, O2, the oxygen in the blood. Um, this one actually, interesting enough, has a little bit of problem because it's very bright. The light shining on the top of my finger actually causes uh, it to misread. So it's uh, pretty impressive actually when you see what the sensor's picking up. And it's, look, it's, it's actually starting to use uh, basically a fast Fourier transform to try to detect my pulse. And it does get there, it does work. In, in more ideal, ideal um, situations, it um, will work reasonably accurately. And if you do have the uh, headphones plugged in, which I will try to plug in, it actually you hear a, a beep. There is a, a pulse, a pulse beep um, if, that, that goes on there. Yeah, there you go. Come on. Not gonna play. <laughs> and it's one of the things, because it's an averaging uh, window in the, in the averaging function, you kind of got to wait for it to catch up and then start to decide. But I'll show you why it has so much trouble. It's really interesting. It, and say, it does work when you don't have the bright lights and all this stuff going on. But look at the sense of what it picks up. It's crazy. Look at the values, right? And I tell you, I've had this running, um, you know, where it, now at the moment it stops. So it, when it detects a finger, it's basically stopping, right? But if I turn off that and just show you this value, it just looks like that all the time, just a higher magnitude of this random noise. It's amazing um, that these uh, fast Fourier transforms and things can pull stuff out of other domains and actually give you something usable. Um, I'd like to just spend then the last few uh, moments uh, just right here to tell you how I became the prince of a town called Belair. No, uh, not that. Um, what I'd like to do is just show you really quickly what the uh, functional kind of diagram is of this. Um, because people again asking, I'll just, oh, I'll just take this one here and show you what we've got really quickly. So you've got a main CPU here on here, which is your ESP32 and I may put a bigger module because I might want more RAM if we want to do emulation. So I might put the one which already has the more RAM in it, the um, SPI connected RAM. And then we have uh, our keyboard here, which is a keyboard uh, matrix of switches. Yeah, you've seen all that kind of, uh, you've got the rows, you've got the columns. And that's going through something called a port expander port expander and this is a 16-bit one like that it's going into there you don't really have to worry how that works so much it does I've done it don't play with it you can blow up the port expander if you mess it up if you're wrong settings and this is running on the I squared C bus which is good and then you have another functional module up here called your OLED which is the screen your OLED LED screen and that is running on another bus here, which is called your SPI bus. And I like how I've shown uh, three Wi-Fi skits we only two for SPI. Uh, yeah, forget these. These are just <laughs> indicative of a bus. But what's interesting, um, I squared C, the actual devices themselves are addressed. So these actually have an address built into them or you can choose it through rounding certain pins. OLED, uh, sorry, SPI devices have a chip select pin. So this has a chip select pin here. And also on the same bus though, we do have the SD card. And that's also got its own chip select line. So we, we choose between which one we want to talk to. And on the I squared C bus, in the example here I showed you, we actually have, um, coming off it there, the, um, um, what are we calling it, particle sensor. But this one, I'm going to do a dotted line around here. This isn't standard because that's just something I've added. So then we have the ESP32 and then that's going to a, that's your USB out here. And that is a 232 converter. Um, <laughs> also, I do forget here, we have a voltage regulator because the this is a 3V3. We are a 3V3 circuit, but also we have coming off, um, well, I suppose the voltage regulator would be here. 
this is the voltage regulator, USB is going into here and then that's providing power to the bus. But also before it gets here we have a charge controller because of course we can run off a lithium cell and all of the charging and uh, discharge protection, all of those things are handled by that charge controller IC. So you can see there we'll be running on battery power now. So that's ready to be have a case in, in um, designed for that. So we have the charge controller and then that goes to the lithium cell. We do have some additional uh, switches and things here like that. These are these are hooked up to the USB to enter the programming modes. Um, shouldn't need them, to be honest with you. You shouldn't need these, but I've noticed Starboard sometimes it, they do need them. I've not really worked out why it's not switching uh, reliably. Sometimes it's I, I, I don't know if it's my USB cable or something like that. Um, oh yes, of course. And then we have the last thing here, which is our audio. And uh, so that is our DAC digital to analog converter, 32 bit. It's important to know that, and I'll tell you why. Um, I squared S, so that's another bus there, an I squared S. And then that automatic, that let's say automatically, that all has built in a small amplifier, but it's more of a headphone level right now. So you'd probably put it into a bigger amplifier like I have if you want to hear it loud. Now the reason it's important to know that that's a 32-bit DAT is because we were messing around with the Tracker Music mod player, and uh, we had a lot of fun because it wasn't working right, and that's because everything in that world was 16 bits. It's ported from the Amiga, and um, <laughs> you're basically um, not giving enough data. You're not going to get uh, enough data going out. So that is everything that you get ready to go, basically, uh, in this device. I'm not selling them yet because it's not it's not really finished. Um, but you can see, you can see where it's going. Yeah, we're getting there, and uh, through the support of the community, um, the software is starting to look pretty, pretty useful. I'm actually at the point now with this that I want to make a case and I want it in my pocket because I want to write an application scientific calculator app. I want to write a Wi-Fi war driving app. I want to write a portable music synthesizer app. There's a, so much I want to do now and I, I just want to use it. I think I'm a, probably a couple of weeks away from finishing all the various drivers we're going to need for that. But as more and more people in the community jump in, you can take my initial efforts and then finish them off. Um, I expect the idea is though that most of you will be coding in the Lua directly you know, and just putting it on the SD card. You won't want to install any of the C compilers, any of that stuff. You won't need to. That's that's my dream ultimately. And I was asked, last, last thing, I was asked if um, you can run forth on it. There's no reason, by the way, if you've got a preference for an interpreter, you want uh, that we couldn't try to port it. We could actually have it in multiple modes, like a menu, and it'll just boot up the appropriate interpreter for the appropriate language file. Yeah, that would be absolutely possible. So yeah, if hopefully that's answered your question. It's absolutely possible. We have a hardware abstraction layer that we're export, exposing to the Lua on this. So yeah, we could expose that to fourth basic. Um, and I'm hoping it to be a little bit more like Stoss on the Atari ST because we could probably handle sprite handling and system interrupts and things like that and sound outside of the OS, uh, outside of the language in the OS itself with interrupts. So you can just turn them all on off and do things. Whew. So there you go. Hopefully you understand a little bit more about what we're trying to do with this and uh, Please jump on the Discord and talk to me if you want to help in developing it or um, developing on it. <laughs> I do have some blank PCBs. If you're prepared to uh, implement some bodges, you know, the little bodges we had, you might want one of those. Or realistically, you might just want to wait till this is done and just buy a, buy a made one, a made one. So, as ever, thank you for watching. <laughs>